So in this video, I'm going to show you exactly what are the blogging tools that you need to use to take your blogging game to the next level. And these are the tools that I use all the time. And the best part is that these are free for you to use. And also, I'm not just listing these tools, but I'm also talking about how to use them and showing you kind of the main use case for each particular tool on the list. So this is going to be a bit of a long video, but after watching this, you will know exactly what are the tools you should use and also what are the tools to avoid because anything that is not included on this list is more or less useless. So I'm not listing out all these pricey SEO tools because they simply don't work. They are just there for marketing and to make the developers of those tools rich. But those don't, those won't help you one bit. And trust me on this one, I have tried out many of those without any results. And by the way, if you want to learn the ins and outs of blogging and how I've been able to use this kind of an SEO free strategy to learn or grow my websites to the next level, make sure to check my free blogging masterclass by clicking the link below. In this masterclass, I teach you my unique strategy and exactly what it takes and how you can succeed with your blog. Alrighty, so let's start with my absolute favorite blogging tool. And that is, of course, Google. And the cool thing about Google is that you can actually save a ton of money by not having to subscribe to these super expensive search engine optimization tools because you get more accurate, more recent and more trendy data directly from Google. So why on earth would you pay for tools that don't even have access to Google's data? And now I'm going to show you how I use it. So the main case or the main use case for Google for me is to have it list some blog post topic ideas. So let's see, for example, let's say that I'm work, working on a blog about bowling. So if I wanted to find blog post topics related to bowling that people are searching on Google and that might bring in some traffic, I can type in something like bowling, how to, and then all of these suggestions are made by Google's AI algorithms. And these are predictions of what I am about to search based on probabilities. And this is an AI model that in other words, just lets me know what are the popular topics related to bowling. So for instance, how to play, how to throw, how to spin, how to curve. These are all topics that people are searching for in masses on Google. And in other words, these are good blog post topic ideas. And now if I actually search for one of these, I can also see these people also ask sections here. And these are also good blog post topic ideas. And some of these are actually better as a subtopic for your main topic. So for instance, if you wrote a blog post on how to hold a bowling ball, you could write a subsection like, if, is there a correct way to hold? How do you hold it properly? And, and of course you don't want to repeat. So for instance, how do you keep a bowling ball is exactly the same thing as how to hold a bowling ball. So you also need to use some common sense here. So if these questions are like answering the same question, or if these questions are exactly the same, but in some different words, then you just want to target it once. So you don't want to, this is not like exact science. So you always need to make sure that the question makes sense in human sense. So sometimes these people also ask suggestions are a bit funky, but you do need to rephrase in a way to make actually sense. And then also if you search or scroll a bit further down the line here, in the search results, you will also see these related searches. And these are actually also good blog post topic ideas. And these are related to your main topic. So these are similar to these people also ask section questions. These are also good either as a subtopic for your blog post or as a separate blog post. And this is the main strategy I use to find blog post topics on my website. Then the next tool in line is Google Trends. So this is also a free piece of software you can access even without signing up. So you just head over to trends.google.com and then you can enter a keyword to see how it's performing. So let's, for example, do something like AI and then let's hit explore. And now here I can see how the AI has performed in Google search results during the past day here in Finland. But of course, that is not something of interest to me because as a blogger, I want to see a bit more like long term results or long term performance. So what I can do instead is first and foremost, choose worldwide. Then I'm going to do, let's say, past five years. And I'm going to see the interesting parts. So for instance, AI has been trending really nicely. It has had some search volume. 
in 2020, 2021, but then all of a sudden, late 2022, there was this huge spike and it has been going up ever since. And this is, of course, because of the launch of ChatGPT. And the way to use this tool, this trends tool, is to find these newly arising topics. So, for instance, let's narrow the time range down a bit. So, let's do something like past 30 days in AI. And now if we scroll down a bit further here, you can actually see these related queries and related topics. And these are the topics that have popped up during this time range, these 30 days. So for instance, Sora OpenAI, Sora, Sora. And then you're going to see all of this Grok AI, Gemini AI, Galileo AI. And these are all topics that are basically rising very rapidly during the past 30 days. And as a matter of fact, we can actually click one of these and we can see how it's performing and we can alter the time range here so we can for example see that google gemini was a huge topic like back in 2023 and then there was this downturn in that topic's performance and then it has started to pick up some steam but nonetheless as a blogger you might want to use this tool to your advantage in finding these new trends. So for instance, if you have like, let's let's look back what there was. There was this Galileo AI, yeah. So you want to spot these new trends that have just popped up into the scene. So you want to have this kind of a very heavily upward trending spike in search volumes. So this data tells me that there is a huge demand for this new tool called Galileo AI. And during February and March 2024, there has been a lot of people searching for that on Google search results. So these just tell you how people are searching. And, and by the way, I already forgot to mention one important thing, but these are not like exact search volumes. So these are relative search volumes. So for instance, it says 74 right over here. It doesn't mean this, that Galileo AI has 74 searches. It means that it has at this date, it has 74% of the maximum, and the maximum happens to be here in uh, this year's February. So these are just percentages. So you can compare how the search term is performing compared to other dates in the past, but you can't tell how many searches a specific search has. And there is actually no way for you to tell that. There is absolutely no tool even Google doesn't make it publicly available. So there is absolutely no way for you to tell how many searches Galileo AI has every month. There are these tools that are trying to estimate the number, but those are usually miles off. So I have been using some search engine optimization tools that say that there is zero searches for something, yet it still has like a couple of thousand. So that's why you don't really even need to know what's the search volume because Google doesn't reveal it. It's useless to estimate it. So let's just use this tool as it is we can see the performance and we can see the important and interesting stuff so we can see what's trending and what's not now back to the topic so if you want to use google trends to your advantage as a blogger what you need to do is find out these topics that have just popped up into the scene that has a huge spike of people interested in those in the web search so people are searching for those on google and then you can write a blog post about it. So for instance, you could write a blog post like how to use Galileo AI or Galileo AI review or something like that. And if it's a new topic, there is not much coverage. In other words, there is not much competition. In other words, you have a great chance to rank high for a topic like this on a new website if it's just popped up into the scene. But if it's an older term, for example, let's see this Galileo AI. Yeah, it has existed for a like one or even one and a half years or so. So this is probably a bit too competitive. But nonetheless, if you were to discover this term right around here in January or February 2023, so that is a year ago, then this would have probably brought you a ton of traffic to your website because there are no other websites covering this topic. So there are no Galileo AI reviews or tutorials just yet. And this is the perfect time to shine for new bloggers. But don't use this strategy that often. I usually do it once or twice a month, but this is something you don't want to do because as you can see actually from this data over here, you can see that the there was this huge spike of interest, but then it quickly died down. So even if you managed to get, let's say 1000 visitors per day to your Galileo AI review, then it would have 
gone down to 100 people because as you can see here it's only 10 percent of the maximum which was right around here just two months prior so this trend died down very quickly but this is super useful if you want to get traffic to your blog especially if you have a new website you don't have that much traffic you might want to spot these new trends and write about those so that there is no competition and that a newer website can actually succeed but just remember that these trends are quickly fading away so you don't want to rely on these i would say that 95 percent of your content should be some evergreen stuff like let's say like pythagorean theorem as you can see this is something that if you were to rank for this term it would have brought you like traffic for 20 years or so so this is consistent but if you do something like fidget spinner you're only going to see this one huge traffic spike you get millions of visitors to a website for perhaps one or two months and then it's completely gone so there's the difference like you want to target these kind of evergreen topics mostly but these trendy topics can also bring you some really nice traffic boost especially if you're a new website owner or if you have already covered all the, all the topics in your niche then you might want to dive deeper into the trends so that you can get these traffic boosts to your website so this is how i use trends then the next tool in line is grammarly and this is actually the Grammarly for Chrome extension. So you want to go to grammarly.com slash browser slash Chrome and then just click on get Grammarly. It's free. Then you sign up here and then you can install the Chrome extension for the this piece of software. And now I'm actually going to show you how it actually works. So if we head over to Medium, so this is just one example blog post editor and I have pasted or created some text here that has some typos. So when you write really quickly, when you just let your thoughts flow into the canvas and you're you're not paying attention to like punctuation, grammatical correctnesses or whatever, then Grammarly will take care of that. So I have Grammarly activated on this website as you can see and here it's highlighting these issues in my text. So all I need to do is hover over them and just click on those mistakes and then Grammarly will actually fix them. And I think that it's lagging right now because I have had this editor open for a while. But as you can see, it is showing the mistakes and I can easily fix those without having to pay attention to those. And sometimes I have seen that this actually lags a bit. So you might need to refresh your page to actually see these errors again. But it is a super, super useful tool because at least I would say this saves me like 30 minutes per blog post because I just can write and then Grammarly will either automatically fix those issues or at least highlight them with this underlining and then I can just click on fix and my proofreading becomes a lot faster. So, and that is simply because I don't really understand English that well in like this grammatical sense. So of course I can speak and I can write but there are a ton of punctuation rules and grammatical rules that I am not familiar with. So this is super useful. This can actually save me a lot of time. And by the way, I have left links to all these tools that I'm showing you in this video into the description of this video, as well as you can actually find this blog post related to this topic that I wrote yesterday. So you can also check that one out, out if you prefer like a written version, but nonetheless, you can find all the links to these useful tools in the description. Next super useful tool is Canva. So this one is actually one of my favorites when it comes to illustrations, visualizations, creating featured images and whatnot, because with this tool, you don't really need to have any experience. You can still write some or create some awesome visualizations. So just head over to canva.com slash create and then click on start designing now. And then it will show you this, all these templates. And it's also showing me, me the previous projects that I have worked with here. But I can, for example, choose something like, let's say, let's do something like a YouTube thumbnail. I can just, it doesn't really matter. I just demonstrate what the tool is and how it actually works. So you can add some text. You can do something really cool like this. You can add some elements. For instance, we can add something like a man or a woman. And we can do all kinds of cool stuff here very easily with the Canva editor. And as you can see, I don't really need to be an expert at design. 
and I can still do something pretty cool looking with just a couple of seconds of work. And this is actually super useful when I write blog posts and if the blog post is like a huge wall of text, I might create a visualization like this on Canva just to make the blog post a bit more interesting and rich in reading experience. So I don't want to have this kind of a super lengthy wall of text. So I can just add something like a visualization like this. And as you can see, I also use this to create my YouTube thumbnails. I use this to create my featured images for my blog post. So this is super, super, super useful. And you can basically configure everything here in a very easy way. So for instance, this dude right here, I can change the color of his pants. I can do whatever I basically want to do in very easy steps. And this is super valuable tool. And this can be a lifesaver because this can actually make your blog post look so much more professional than what they would be without these images. And it can give you this kind of a professional look that you also know how to design these blog posts and design these visualizations, even though you're just using like free stuff from basically canvas on website. So this is like a really nice growth hack or life hack for a blogger. I definitely would give it a try because you need a ton of visualizations and visual elements to your blog posts if you want to stand out because these days nobody wants to read a lengthy wall of text. And then the next tool is HemingwayApp.com. And this is actually very similar to Grammarly, but this is a standalone tool that you can use with the HemingwayApp.com's website. So basically what you want to do here is you can paste some text here. So for instance, it could be your blog post. And then once you have pasted your text here, the Hemingway app will show the issues that exist. So here on the right hand side, you can actually see that it's saying those issues or stating those out, but it is also showing them here in the text. So for instance, if I hover over this, it is saying that this sentence is too long and complex. Use shorter sentences and simple words. And then I can make the edits until it doesn't warn this anymore. And then also it's showing me that I'm using the word just and it's suggesting like to be bold, don't hedge. I think we should becomes we should and stuff like that. So the word just is actually redundant. So I can just click on that to remove it. And I can also do the same here. And then you can also see that I have said like and replace the feature in order to replace. And here it's also saying that use simpler alternative to remove. So uh, or uh, like use simpler alternatives or remove. So basically it's saying that in order to is a way too complicated way to say the word to. So why, why on earth would you say in order to because you can just say to. So I can already fix that. And then I can also do some ch like changes here to make this senses a bit shorter and then i can also use ai these days this didn't used to be the case when i used this tool like two years ago three years ago when i was starting but now you can also fix your sentences with ai but i think that's a paid plan so we don't need that we can just use this and just one thing to keep in mind is that take these suggestions with a grain of salt because if you implement or basically fix everything that this tool says your text will end up looking very generic it doesn't have any like unique characteristics from your writing style or your tone of tone of voice is basically stripped down because if you strip all these words like in order to or just or whatever you have used to use, then the text will become this kind of, it will follow this kind of an equation. It will be always like no more than 15 words in length per sentence and you don't have any like complex words or anything that you would normally use. Well, I'm not saying that a complex word is actually a good thing, but if you have used to use some kind of a word, for example, in your videos or when you talk to your friends or whatever, and then this Hemingway is telling you to get rid of that, it is stripping down your tone of voice and your originality and uniqueness from the text. So we use this with a bit of a grain of salt. And also, if you have a clearly reading sentence that is very long and it's saying like, this is super long, perhaps just don't fix it and let it be. So if I were to paste some of my blog content here, it would be full of these warnings and errors. So it doesn't really matter. So you don't want to make this like nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 every time, but you want to use this to give you some direction, I would say, especially when I was starting, this was a really useful tool to give me some idea of what's going wrong and what's right in my text. So make sure to check it out. And then we of course have a ChatGPT, and this is the only tool that I'm currently paying a monthly subscription fee for. So 
I'm not really using it to automate my blog posts. Actually, it's a strategy that I have tried but failed very miserably. Really, so I don't really think it's a good idea. And I have actually made a separate video that explains why it doesn't really work and why it's not even supposed to work. But you can use ChatGPT to like escape your writer's blog and you can use it to do some automations. For example, you can use outlining or stuff like that. You can rephrase complex sentences that you have produced or whatever. So for instance, let's say that I'm reviewing Bose NC700 headphones and I want to be able to produce this super long and detailed and informative blog post that reviews the tool and every part of it. So I can use ChatGPT to ask for an outline for that kind of review. So for instance, let's do something like this. So now the ChatGPT is working and it's creating me this kind of a full or complete outline, which basically covers every single aspect and thing I should cover when talking about this headset. And also you need to be careful here. So you don't want to like overcomplicate things. You want to keep your audience in mind. So if you're using ChatGPT to generate outlines or let's say even introductions or some key feature sections or whatever belongs to your blog post and what is some automated task that you don't want to do manually because you can do it with ChatGPT? Just be careful because ChatGPT tends to jargonize a lot of stuff. It tends to add something extra to everything. So it doesn't really consider the user that much. And I have been using this tool for a really long time. And I can tell that it's actually, it's an okay tool, but it's sometimes adding something very crazy into these reviews. For example, when I asked initially to give the outline, it actually asked me to write about the history of Bose. So that is, of course, something that I don't want to include at the beginning of this kind of a review because I want to just <laughs> be helpful or useful for a person that is looking to make a purchase and they just quickly want to see what kind of experiences people have had with this kind of a headset. But nonetheless, as you can see, it's actually a very comprehensive and detailed outline and this is super useful for me and now what I can do is just start using this headset and basically just fill in everything that ChatGPT asks me to do so the most experience or the most important part about a review or any kind of a blog post is to show your experience and expertise with a topic because you want to be useful and unique and original if you just use ChatGPT to write this blog post, so for instance, if I told ChatGPT to just start writing this review, it would never rank on Google because it doesn't really add anything new to the internet because it just summarizes what other people have already said about this product on the internet. So that's the thing here. So you can use it to outline your blog posts. You can use it to do even some basic research. So I could, for example, ask ChatGPT to list the key features of this headset so that I don't have to look it up from the landing page, then I just need to make sure that those are correct. So as I've been using this tool for or this product for a while, I know that if it's jargonizing or just trying to come up with something. But nonetheless, this is like the favorite way for me to use ChatGPT. So it's actually just a like this super useful assistant that can outline my blog posts, help me with a writer's blog, but it doesn't really add anything to the blog post. So I still need to do the hard work. So this tool only saves like a couple of hours per week from my 40 to 60 hour working weeks. Then the next tool is Logo AI. So this tool will actually generate a logo for your website. And I have to be honest here, I haven't really used it to generate logos, but that might also be partly because I have heard about this tool way after I started creating blogs and websites. So I have had a habit of just creating this kind of basic logo with like Canva or something. But nonetheless, this can be useful. And just to be transparent, this is a paid tool, but you can use it for free. So for example, if I go here, let's make a logo. I can start like, let's do something like example.com, example website. This is just to show you how it works. So it's very simple. It's asking basically for your website and then it's going to ask you for your niche. Then it's going to ask some color schemes or color features that you like and then it will ask for the style i can do something like this and then you can just generate these logos and it's taking a while for the ai to render these logos but then once you have or once the ai has completed you can see this they have these watermarks all over the place but if you like one of these logos you can actually start using it and then if you want to use it you also need to pay for it so 
this is something you need to keep in mind and you can also edit the logo if you want to but for the sake of demonstration this is simply how it works so you just tell the AI what to generate and you're going to see a lot of stuff or this a lot of these example logos that the AI produces and then you can just do some quick tweaks here and the good thing about this is that this is not just an image that you're going to download but this is an actual legitimate logo so if you think about a logo it needs to have a color scheme and it has to have all these like dimensions and everything in place so this is not just something that you can drag and drop somewhere and then if you place it on your wall it will look like a blurry mess because it's never or it hasn't been designed with vectors so these are actually real logos or I don't know how to use the terminology here because I'm not a professional logo designer but you get what I'm saying so this is not just an image that the AI rendered like if you for example use ChatGPT to generate a logo but this is an actual logo with all the dimensions and bells and whistles that a logo needs. Then the next tool or service I'd rather call it is Unsplash and with Unsplash you can find these high quality stock footage or stock photos that professional photographers around the world have taken. So these are super useful. For instance, let's say that you have a blog post that is a huge wall of text. And the reality is that these days people don't want to read these kinds of text walls. So what you want to do instead is add some images into the mix. So let's head over to unsplash.com and search for something. So let's say that we're searching for cat. Now, these are images that you are free to download, or these are images that you can freely use in your blog posts, except for these that have this small plus icon here. So these are like premium images that you need to subscribe to Unsplash Premium if you want to use those. But most of these images are free. So for instance, if I wanted to use this image, I could just click on it. I can click on here to download. And as I download, it is also going to show me this kind of th say thanks thing here. So I can just copy here. And now if I were to use this image in my blog post, I could just paste this copied part here to the caption of the image to give credits to the author or the photographer of this image. So this is actually very simple. And these images can make your blog post stand out because you never want to write a wall of text. You can actually, or you need to actually make it more interesting by using these images and if you don't have any visualizations of your own if you haven't taken any photographs or if you're feeling lazy then you can use these generic stock images but just remember that these are something i usually don't really use because these are not like directly providing value so if a blog post has a specific use case or it's demonstrating something very specific you won't find it any useful to use this kind of generic stock footage Instead, what you want to do is create your own visualizations or take your own images. For instance, if you were to like review a headset, you don't want to go to Unsplash and choose a generic image like this, but you would actually need to take an image of yourself like this, for example. So it always needs to be authentic, unique and original. But if your content is like mostly text and it doesn't really need any images, it still needs those because these days people are not like going to stay around for a while if they see only text so then you can use these generic stock images to like enrich your reading experience and speaking of stock footage if there is a scenario where you cannot find a good picture on the internet you can use ai to generate one of course these come with varying results so you don't always get like the kind of photo that you actually wanted but you can get close with AI and this is where you can use a tool called Ideogram. So this is completely free. You can head over to ideogram.ai slash t slash explore and then type in something. So I can do something like lake in Finland and then hit enter. And this will take like 20, 30 seconds to generate all these images. So these are really nice if you don't have the paid plan for ChatGPT Premium where you could use DALI to generate images. I have found out that this ideogram is basically just as good in most aspects. So for instance, if we look at this image here, this looks like it's unreal how good this actually is. I live in Finland and this is exactly how like, uh, well, the lake color is a bit <laughs> too vibrant for my liking, but this is exactly how it looks like here in Finland. So this is crazy good. And it generated in only like 15 seconds or so. So you can use these kinds of images in your blog posts to make your point clear or your, 
you can use this to like enrich the reading experience to make your blog post stand out a bit more. So if you have a just a long wall of text, these images can make it stand out. But remember that these AI images are becoming more and more generic and more and more people are using those. So your blog post will also end up looking very generic if you don't know how to use the AI properly. So if you only fill in your blog post with all these AI generated images, people will not stay because it's essentially the same as a wall of text. It just looks very boring and generic. At the end of the day, what you want to do is add some really like useful images. So for instance, if you look at this blog post that I wrote about this very video that I'm recording right here, right now. So best blogging tools, as you can see, this is full of images of myself using these tools and products. And this is what makes the blog post stand out. So if I were to use some AI images here, it would make absolutely no sense because it wouldn't help the visitor. And that is something anybody could do. In other words, that is something where you would have no chances to stand out or to get visitors. And then the next tool in line is Google Analytics. And now I'm going to show you how to use it before I'm going to show you how to install it. So basically Google Analytics allows you to see this kind of data on your website. So for instance, you can see how many users have come to your website, how many events they have triggered. So for instance, if somebody clicks on something, downloads something, leaves a comment, it adds to this event count. And the main way to use this service is simply by going to the report section and then heading over to the engagement section and pages and screens. So here you can actually see what pages have been viewed on your website. And, and for example, here, this is just a sample website that I have. So this is not something, this is not secret data. I'm not revealing it by accident. This is, it is actually something that I want to show you just for the sake of demonstrating how it works. So for instance, here we can see that ML and AI glossary blog post is the most popular blog post on this particular website during the past, what, 28 days. And then you can see that the front page is the second most visited page. And then we have all these other blog posts. We have coding glossary. And these are just basically different pages on our website that gets views. And this is the main way to use this. So especially as a beginner, you don't really need to worry about stuff like average engagement time or conversions or total revenue or whatever it is. Because at the end of the day, the main thing is to get traffic to a website. So once you get to like tens or hundreds of thousands of people per month visiting your website, then you can start paying attention to this data. So you can see that if there's a web page that is like five minutes in reading time, but also only has like, let's say seven seconds of average engagement time, then that might be a bit alarming and there might be something wrong with your website or with your blog post. But for now, it's just enough to know that you, you can use this analytics and go to engagement and watch these page, pages and screens to see what kinds of pages have gotten traffic on your website. And now when it comes to installing this piece of software, you can actually head over to your WordPress dashboard if you're using your WordPress. If you're not using WordPress, then you can just go to analytics.google.com and they will get you from there. But this is something that I recommend doing. So you go to your WordPress site you go to plugins, then you go to add new plugin, then just search for a site kit by Google and choose this first option here. So site kit by Google, analytics, search console, AdSense and speed, and then just install and activate it. And there, the setup wizard will guide you through the entire process. So they will install you this analytics property on your website. So then you don't have to do it via the analytics page, you can do it here. And the benefit from this is actually what also brings me to the next tool in line. So you can also add the Google search console to your website. And this is the next tool that I was also going to show you. So Google analytics shows you all these kind of pages, number of users, page views per user. You can see where people have come to your page. So for example, it can be Instagram, WhatsApp group, Facebook group, and it can be Google search results. But then we have Google search console, which is a different analytics service. So this is only showing you how the website is performing on Google. So for example, here's a 
website that I'm just showing. And this is the main way to use it also. So, so on Google Search Console, what you want to do is head over to this performance tab right here on the left hand side of the view. And then you're going to see the number of clicks and impressions that your website has gotten from Google. So this data is directly from Google. So this shows how the blogs or the websites are performing on Google only. So in this analytics page, you can see all these performances wherever the traffic comes from. So for example, here you can see that we have had we have had 100 and almost 150 page views for this website during the past 28 days. But if we look at that from the Google Search Console, we can only see that there are six clicks from Google. So basically this means that most of the traffic has come to this website via another route. So this is not coming from Google. But nonetheless, this is the main way to use it. So here you also want to see that your blogs is or your blog post or whatever it is, web page, blog post, whatnot, is seeing this kind of a slowly rising trend in clicks and impressions. So these clicks is the number of people that have clicked one of your blog posts in the Google search results. And this impressions tab shows you how many people have actually seen your blog posts in the Google search results. So they haven't clicked your page but they have basically noticed it in the search results as one of the options to click. And this is super handy. At the moment, if you're a beginner blogger and if you don't have like millions of visitors to a website, the only things you really should pay attention to is Google Analytics engagement pages and screen section, just to see which pages are getting traffic and that the traffic is going upwards. And then also on Google Search Console, you want to see that the impressions and clicks are going upwards. And something that is also useful in Google Search Console is that they will send you these kind of detailed reports. So if you got an email from Google Search Console, always make sure to check that out because there might be some issues on your website. So for instance, if you had published a blog post, but you had published it in such a way that Google doesn't see it or Google's robots are not allowed to read it, then it won't get any visitors from Google because Google are not able to add it into the search results. And this is where they might send you this warning here. So for example, I have 10 messages right over here. And then you can see those messages and fix those issues so that you can appear on Google. So this is super useful. This is Google specific, this Google search console and the analytics is an overall view that shows like the views and whatnot. But both of these services are available to you by using this plugin called Sidekit by Google. So once you install this Sidekit by Google to your WordPress website, it will install you this analytics property as well as this Google Search Console property. So that's very handy. It's only taking like a couple of minutes. And then if you have a new website and there's not much data, and as a matter of fact, I don't even think it has to do with the age of the website, Google just needs to spend a while gathering the data. So once you have activated your Sidekit, it will take a couple of days before you see this data or this data on your website. And if you have a new website, if you just launched it, it might be that there are no visitors. So you might not see like anything here. It might say zero here and zero here. And that is completely normal. So it will take a couple of months and a bunch of blog posts before Google starts to show them in the search results. And here in the analytics page, you're going to see at least some views because it means that you have actually visited your own website. But nonetheless, this is how you can track the analytics of your or the performance of your website. Oh, so there are so many things that you can discover here in the analytics as well as here in Google Search Console. But at, as the first step is just to follow these pages and screens on the analytics page. And most importantly, you want to perform or track the performance in Google search results because that is your main traffic source. So if there was only one thing that you were able to keep from your analytics or Google search console, it would be this view right here. This is the most important one. This is what tells you that you are having long-term or not having long-term success on Google if you see this kind of data here. So for instance, if the data was coming down here, it would mean that Google is slowly taking your blog posts away from the Google search results and that would be alarming. So if there was only one place where you were allowed to go to see your site's performance, is it would be this view. So I wouldn't even use Google Analytics at first. I would just use this one. So you go to your site property, performance, and then click on this 
total clicks and impressions to see how the website is performing on Google search results. So I know there's a bunch of new stuff in this video. I know that there's a lot of information and this looks like a really complicated page as well as this one because you have all these metrics and reports. But just make sure that when you have a web website or a blog that this view is available to you and make sure that from time to time that the clicks and impressions are going upwards. And then the next tool is Updraft Plus. So you definitely don't want to have your site run without backup. So it would be a catastrophe if you lost all your data. And even though most of the web hosting services these days actually offer some backup services, you still want to make sure that you have a backup of your own. So if something catastrophe, catastrophic happens on your website, and you can't really get your blog posts back, then you have these backups and you can just upload them. And then your site has been basically reset to the point when you last took your backups. And to find this backup service, just head over to your WordPress dashboard, click on plugins, and then search for Updraft Plus. And then this first tool right here is the one that you wanna use. So install it, activate it, and make sure to go through the setup wizard. So this will actually guide you through the entire process. So it will ask you where you want to store the backups, how often you want to do it and whatnot. So make sure to do that. And then your site will automatically be backed up. And by the way, I am using like Google Drive to store these backups in. So that is, I think, the only free option out there and the only easy option out there for you. So make sure to set up a Google Drive account for you as well before setting up this one so that you can actually have your website stored there securely through the Updraft Plus service. And then last but not least, if you have some images you want to add to your blog post, but if those images are not of high quality, you can add those images into this stock photos image upscaler. So you can just drag and drop an image right over here. And for example, I did that yesterday on one of my images and here you can see the performance. So this left-hand side image is the original one. It's very blurry and you can't really make mo that much out of it if you added this to a blog post. But then if you add it to the upscaler and let the AI do the magic, you can actually see that this image starts to look very high in detail and looks really nice. And you can actually use this free 2x upscaled version. But if you want to uh, upscale it even more, so if you have an even more blurry image, or if you want to show this on a bigger screen, then you might want to use the 4x or 8x upscaling. And this is something you need to pay for, but it's very cheap. So nonetheless, this is a good tool. If you have some really nice images that you would like to use in your blog post, but those are blurry or some, they have some artifacts. So you can use this kind of product, AI powered product to actually make the images look way better.